Hi, this is Eric Posner from the University of Chicago, and um, I'm talking today with Steve. Uh, with Who are St you? <laughs> I often wonder that question. Uh, <laughs> this is Stephen Davidoff, and I'm, I'm a professor at the University of Connecticut School of Law, um, and uh, this year I'm actually visiting at Ohio State uh, Law School. Go Bucks! Okay, and I, I would I would root for my team here at the University of Chicago if we had one, or I knew what it was, but yes. I don't think we have one. Uh, you probably have a very good math team, I would expect. I'm sure, and I'm, I'm, I support them. Yeah, yes, absolutely. So uh, we're going to talk about the financial crisis uh, today. Now, uh, we're both lawyers, and we're going to take more of a, a legal, maybe legal economic uh, approach to the financial crisis than, uh, than economists have. And, and Steve, let's start off uh, by trying to find some people to blame for the mess that, that we're in. Uh, who do you think we should blame? Well, you know, I, I, I have a controversial and maybe not a self-satisfying uh, uh, blame, which is I think we should blame ourselves. Uh, I think we, uh, for too long, treated our houses like ATMs. Uh, we overspent um, and borrowed too much and bought things from abroad um, under inappropriate labor standards that we probably shouldn't. This is the schlock in front of Lowe's that your kids often pester you to buy. And um, we've overspent, and um, the government encouraged that. So I, I start by blaming ourselves, to be honest, Eric. Blaming ourselves? Are you blaming me also? I, I think of myself as a financial genius because I bought my house, and a couple years later it was worth twice as much as what I paid for it. So, But then a couple of years after that, it's back at what I originally paid for it. So, so maybe I'm not such a genius. Um, but, the, yes. but, the, but blaming ordinary, you know, everybody, um, I don't know what to say about that. Uh, of course, some people have been responsible. Some people have been greedy and irresponsible. But um, it's not, I, I don't know whether it's, it's so useful to blame people because ultimately what we want to do is talk about what the government should do. And um, it's not clear, at least in a democratic society anyway, that we, if, if we're to blame for our bad behavior, we're going we're gonna to tell the, the government to discipline us. Well, I don't. I, I think that's a, that's a very good point, and and uh, I I think one of the things that we have to do in this financial crisis is uh, stem backlash and stem um, stem people from um, looking backward in some sense. Although we should for any reform, but we should look forward in terms of seeing what the errors were of the past to correct them. And, and I agree with you that um, today the solution uh, for good or for bad lies with the government. Um, and how the people interact with the government. Well, let's go into more detail, though, about your original point about, about who to blame. So, so clearly we can't blame everybody. Every, not everybody acted irresponsibly. There are a lot of people out there who, 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 who saved money, who did not buy houses that were too expensive. There, there are a subset of people who, um, who overconsumed. But um, a lot of those people, at least the story is, uh, were misled. Um, they were misled by uh, uh, bankers and, and mortgage brokers. They signed papers that they didn't really understand uh, very well. And um, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm sure. And then, of course, there are people who were speculating and, and, and so forth. But I, I'm not sure. Should we blame? Should we blame a lot of these people who bought subprime mortgages? Maybe, maybe they were just. Um, Misled, or, or we simply couldn't, can't expect people in that position to make the sort of sophisticated financial decisions well, that, uh, that, let's say, uh, you know, finance whizzes can make. Well, that that, that may be true, um, and I, but I do like to think that we don't have um, a, a paternal government. Uh, nonetheless, I think that um, you do you do make a point, which is it's not just all of us to blame. It's it's subsets in, in a sense, and one of the subsets has been um, the mortgage lending industry, uh, mm -hmm. and it's it's become clear, I think, um, and and you can agree or disagree that the standards in that industry, which was underregulated, um, allowed for. Um, Practices which, to say the least, were uh, deceptive sometimes uh, and uh, lacking fulsome disclosure. Um, and in a sense, they fell through the cracks of the regulatory scheme and, uh, and leveraged that to uh, sell products that, you're right, people sometimes didn't understand. Some did, but some didn't. Mm -hmm. 
So a number of these people engaged in pretty straightforward bad behavior fraud, or and I'm talking about the um, the mortgage uh, brokers and, and the loan originators engaged right. in various types of bad behavior, which is illegal already, or you know, or is close to being illegal. They engaged in fraud, or they engaged maybe not in fraud, but deceptive practices. But that wasn't the only problem. That happens all the time in, in all economies, and the law can go after people like that and reduce that behavior to some extent. But uh, I think people tend to, to blame uh, the, finance, uh, the financial industry more than uh, these loan originators. The uh, investment banks, um, uh, the, uh, you know, the people who run uh, banks, uh, the people who evaluated risks in banks, and certainly the, uh, the rating companies. What about those people? Should we be blaming uh, those people? Or were they just acting rationally given the regulatory structure that they were working under? Well, I, I'll give you my opinion, Eric, and I'd be interested to hear yours. Um, and I think uh, what happened is the securitization process, which is uh, 30, 40 years ago, we had the It's a Wonderful Life uh, model of banking. You saw your banker on the street. Your banker knew your finances. Your banker was worried about you repaying the loan because it was repaid to the bank. That just no longer exists. Uh, now, yeah, uh, and Jimmy Stewart character, he was kind of a crook anyway. Yes, I, I like the alternative views of Jimmy Stewart that are emerging. Uh, and, and the fact that Jimmy Stewart would probably be one of the people uh, villainized now um, yeah. in, in our universe. Uh, Shoddy banking right. practices, giving uh, you know, loans to sympathetic people without checking their you know, their income and assets and so forth. But anyway, exactly. I no, 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 uh, no. We all want to live yeah. in Potterville. Uh, yeah, yeah um, me, me definitely. Yeah. Um, but, but what I think is, um, and, and, is that uh, the, the, the beauty of securitization is they take all of these loans, they pool them together, um, and they sell them to investors. And it allows uh, for two things. One, it allows for better pricing of risk because you have more people assessing the price. And two, it allows banks to extend more mortgages because they uh, move the mortgages off their balance sheets. Uh, unfortunately, what happened here is that the banks became more concerned with selling the product than whether it would be repaid. Uh, and um, these are externalities that the banks uh, leveraged off of. Um, and what they did is uh, they packaged these products and they didn't properly assess the risk. Now, although w w let me just interrupt right. briefly there. But so I understand that the loan originators, some of whom were banks, some of whom were other people like mortgage brokers, that you know they they engaged in lax practices. Let's let's call them, but in part because the people who are buying the loans from them and then repackaging them into securities didn't demand uh, more scrupulous accounting. In other words, the market, the, the investors, the people who, who ultimately would buy these, these mortgage-backed securities didn't seem tremendously concerned about how risky these, these loans were. And so the, the banks were, you know, rational actors. They're like, they're like uh, used car salesmen. If people want to pay a lot of money for a used car... Uh, that it's it's not up it, it's not it's not for the salesman to say to them hey you know this car might not work very well or work as well as you think it might it's up to the buyer especially when they're very sophisticated uh, to you know evaluate the risk on their own and and and, and take it if, if they think it's it's worth it well, so I, I'm not sure I would I would blame the the uh, loan originators here here I would think that. Um, it was really the investors, right? It wasn't. It wasn't at the investors, um, the people who ultimately bought the mortgage-backed securities, who are responsible uh, for our current crisis. Well, you, you've hit along perhaps a puzzle and maybe a mystery to me at least, and, and you might. I'd, I'd like to hear what you have to say about it. But why did these investors purchase them? And and here I think there are two sub questions. The first is why did the banks not care enough about their reputational capital to sell this stuff? So why were they acting like used car salesmen and not like um, like uh, the emperor's wife? Um, because they knew they were going to be back in the market to sell this. The, the second thing is, why did investors buy this? And in fact, 
why did they depend upon the ratings agencies? Agencies, And it's here where perhaps another villain comes in. Um, the rating agencies were assigned to, uh, to rate these products, uh, often gave them AAA ratings. Um, why did investors rely upon them if they did, knowing that rating agencies have failed repeatedly in Enron, um, now here? Um, and, and why do investors keep, uh, keep relying upon... Uh, these rating agencies, or if they're not, what are they doing in buying this product? And I just don't know the answer to that. And I think in that we might have some clues to what happened here. Well, I think there, there are two basic approaches uh, to thinking about this. You know, one, one is that these investors were rational and they just took a risk. Um, and the other is that they were not rational, <laughs> that they right. either either that they, you know, got caught up in uh, animal spirits or um, or in the enthusiasm of a, of a booming market or they simply didn't understand these financial products uh, as well as they the, as well as they should have. Now, the, 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 on the first theory, they you know, everybody understands that even when you buy something that's safe, uh, there's a, uh, that is debt that's safe. There's a risk that uh, everything will fall apart. You know, there could be wars. There could be, well, depressions. And, and people have understood depressions have occurred in the past. They might occur again. Um, and so, in a way, there are no villains here. Well, we, we can talk about villainy in a moment. But we could say that these investors, they were just acting rationally, and they, they made risky investments that turned out Bad, and they lost their money as re, as a result. You know, big deal. Um, the other uh, view is that they, you know, they got caught up in in the in the enthusiasm. They were excessively optimistic. They didn't really understand what was going on. There's actually a lot of evidence of that. Um, that, that for example, the risk spread between very safe investments like in treasuries and incredibly risky, you know, subprime. Mortgages was was very small, suggesting that people treated these as essentially the same or very close to the same in terms of risk, which which would be uh, which would be amazing and which would possibly you know be based on an assumption that, for example, that housing prices inevitably increase. Um, but it's what's funny about calling these people villains, it seems to me, or blaming them, is that. Um, these investors is that you know if, if if you go out and you buy something, let's say a car. You know, let's say you buy you go out and you buy a car. Let's say it's a used car, and the the salesman doesn't really deceive you or anything. He just says, look, you, you know, pay is what I'm offering, and and you pay it, and then later you don't like it. Uh, we we don't say that you're a villain. We say that you made a mistake. You should have consulted more people. You should have read uh, consumer reports. Um, you, uh, you know, and that's that's the end of the story. Um, I, I think part of what was going on here may have been that the investors thought that, you know, they could insure themselves by be- buying uh, credit default uh, swaps and and their other and, and simply by diversifying their portfolios so that they weren't tremendously worried about uh, the risk that they were taking on, and that the real problem was not that they were stupid or bad people, but that. Um, their purchases had these these uh, externalities that um, that essentially when they purchased this these these uh, securities they increased the risk that existed in the system as ho- as a whole. So when the uh, the housing uh, bubble popped, um, there was a the the, the uh, negative consequence was much more significant than it would have been otherwise. I, I think I think you're, you're on to something, I, and I, I, I would add. Uh, well, again, two things to that. First, I, I do think you're right that in terms of villains versus just people at fault versus people who uh, were part of the system, um, the villains are, are probably few in nature who acted willfully knowing what they were doing. Uh, the, the rest of us uh, may have been acting rationally, um, but I, I do think there is something to what you say is the animal spirits, uh, because risk even... Risk during this time just seems severely mispriced, and, and I, I study the M and A market. Mm-hmm. And if you look at the leverage buyout market during that time, uh, you could really sell anything. Um, and and uh, it, it just seems that the pricing was just was just completely off. Um, even even if you do assume uh, a normal adverse events such as a recession or mm-hmm. uh, a decline in in um, in the economy, 
what seemed to have happened is that people uh, were chasing credit yield. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and they may have been acting rationally there, but interest rates were uh, very low during that time, which, which may lead to another possible uh, area of blame, which is uh, the Fed and, and Alan right. Greenspan. Well, I wanted to move on to you know another set of, of villains uh, could be found in the government. Yes, and certainly a lot of conservatives have made that argument. And and one possible villain then is Greenspan. Why don't you say more about about that? Well, you know, I'm not a macroeconomic, a macroeconomist, so take take what I say with a grain of salt. But essentially, um, after nine uh, eleven, Greenspan aggressively lowered interest rates, um, and what happened there is um, he kept them low for an extended period of time. Uh, in a time of low interest rates, uh, people chase yield. They they chase higher returns because they need to to fund pensions, endowments, etc. And that led to people um, paying a premium uh, for more risky investments. And what I mean by a premium is they paid a lower interest rate than they normally would. Um, tied up into this mix, uh, which we may want to cover separately, is the, the China problem, mm-hmm. which is uh, we've been buying... Uh, we have a we have a savings imbalance with China, um, and they have been using uh, their trade surplus to buy treasuries, which has further pushed down yields, and again force people into um, more risky and higher yielding investments. Uh, but so again, we can, China, we, can blame, we can blame China rather than our own people. Well, I, I think it certainly makes for a better movie. Uh, you know. <laughs> can we really blame China, though? It, it seems to me that. You know, there. Uh, you know, this is at the limits of my knowledge, also. So, so maybe we shouldn't spend too much time on it. But, but they were they were um, they were just pursuing a kind of a rational strategy of um, uh, of trying to uh, maximize their export. You know, uh, advance their export driven economy as a way of um, of, uh, of of keeping up with this uh, enormous uh, demand for for jobs in, in China as people move from the yeah. rural areas uh, to the cities and. It, uh, you know, w- w- it, it benefited us in a way, right? We got cheap credit out of out of it. Sure. It benefited China from from their perspective. They they, they managed to keep, uh, you know, essentially full employment or something like that. Um, so so you know so so what what's the problem with China? Well, I don't I don't know if it, when I say blame. I, I yeah. agree with you. They were acting in their rational economic interest, and, and no different I mean, should, than should we have done something different? I guess you, you, you blame uh, American officials for failing to try to compel China to change their exchange rate policies. Well, I think we set up. We again, we're probably going outside my realm, but in the political realm, in a perfect world, we should have taken steps to. Um, put currency on parity, and also uh, we've outsourced our environmental and labor problems. Uh, it, it, I say this to my corporate, my corporations class. If someone built a uh, you know polluting, um, environmentally non-compliant plant to produce light bulbs uh, next to your house, would you complain? Would you think that was wrong? Would you buy those light bulbs? And the answer is invariably uh, no. We wouldn't, but we're, we're quite happy to put those in China. And, uh, and and buy those those products and, and perhaps this is off topic but uh, one of the things we've done by that is is we've produced this uh, trade imbalance and and also um, in a time it, it produced and this is Elizabeth Warren at Harvard has talked about this it's produced um, it's resulted in stagnant wages for the American worker so the anti blame the U S uh, people is that in a time when they weren't making significant wages, they just focused on something they could make money on, which was their house. Well, I, I guess I, 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 I'm a little skeptical of, of that line of thinking. When we, when we, when you know, the, these factories go into other countries, these other countries have different environmental standards, usually because they're at a lower level of development. So people in those other countries, now of course China has an authoritarian system, so it's hard to know for sure, but in many of these countries, India for example, which is a democracy, people will accept um, uh, lower environmental standards because they're concerned about other aspects of their wealth, well-being, you know, just having basic consumer goods, maybe being able to drive to work rather than 
you know, taking a bus, which is takes a long time, and so forth. Right. So, so you know, that's just a part of of international trade, and and it benefits Americans. Of course, it does keep wages down, uh, but it because of course, um, the you know American workers are competing with a billion or whatever many hundreds of millions of Chinese workers who will accept lower wages. So it does keep wages down in the United States, but it also keeps um, the price of consumer goods down. And if you're a worker, you know you don't want your wages to be low, but if the price of consumer goods is low as well, you may well be better off, as, as I suspect uh, uh, people generally were. I mean, consumer goods have become, over the 90s and zeros, have become incredibly cheap. But let's yes. just ag- agree to disagree about this issue, because yes. I do think it's, it's, it's a bit off topic. I don't think... Um, I don't think you know, international trade uh, has contributed to the uh, current financial crisis. What, uh, or if it has, it's it's, it's been a, a minor uh, point. But maybe we should move on, and we'll, we'll come back to this question of um, of uh, what went wrong when, when we when we talk about what what the government should do next in order to can, try to. Can prevent, I add just uh, one thing, Eric? Mm-hmm. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. I, sure. I do think, if as long as we're in the government, we do need to say uh, one issue about. Mm-hmm in this who is to blame um and and i think it's clear that the regulatory system in the u.s for the capital markets um has been outdated um and is fractured um something that that people have known for a long time uh and and in some respects there's been an argument to keep uh for example the cftc and sec separate um, as a political for political competition purposes uh but uh what happened is in, in a regulatory system. Right. Where Just we had, to interrupt, this, the CFTC regulates commodities trading and the SEC regulates stock trading. Yes. Right. Right. Okay. And, and so we have, um, I think the last time I checked, about 11 federal regulators of banks mm-hmm. in the financial system. Right. There's the Office of Thrift Supervision and the FDIC and, you know, countless, countless, uh, the Fed, countless uh, agencies. Right. Doing this. And, and the problem is that that led to. No one really keeping an eye on the general system for systemic risk, um, where there's no real regulatory capacity. And in addition, um, in the mortgage origination um, area where this all came about, you had multiple regulators. So, for example, the Fed regulated disclosure uh, for mortgages. Uh, and you had different regula- – the SEC regulated the secur- securitization process, although um, they were hampered by statute from uh, fully regulating it, although it's a question whether they would have anyway. All right. So we want a giant sort of financial equi- equivalent of the Department of Homeland Security. That was the same theory, and, of course, there, there are funny parallels here. So the, the theory after 9-11 was that one of the reasons why this terrorist attack wasn't prevented was that the security – the, you know, the people who are responsible for security are spread through all these different agencies, Department of Justice, INS. INS is actually in the Department of Justice, but anyway, in the Pentagon and, and various other places. And we and we should put them all together in one gargantuan uh, agency. Right. And, and people are making the same argument here. And I, th- I think the argument here is stronger. I mean, I basically agree with you. But the, 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 the real challenge is not so much um, combining agencies as figuring out what exactly to regulate. And, and so, you know, part of the reason why we have these different agencies is that um, one part of the financial industry is regulated uh, much more closely than another part of the financial uh, industry, in other words, banks, right? So banks have always been heavily regulated and were throughout this before and during this crisis. But um, the other part of the financial industry, the hedge funds and the investment banks and so forth, were regulated um, a lot less. And so, and, you know, as we were talking about before, if the banks, if many banks anyway, just uh, originate these loans and sell them off to the financial industry, which is where all the action happens, where people decide how much risk to take and and so forth, then the fact that the banks are being regulated doesn't help an enormous amount. And indeed, the banks would then, a lot of the banks would then turn around and buy a lot of these um, Financial instruments, and when they did, they were, you know, they were regulated. You know, these these mortgage-backed securities were part of their assets and and had to meet certain requirements in order to satisfy uh, the the bank regulators. But but at least you know the banks were under somewhat more supervision uh, than the, than the rest of the system. 
uh, was. And part of the challenge will be trying to bring the whole system under one uh, regulatory uh, framework. Yes, but, I, I agree. Yeah, but uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the crisis. Um, you know, I'm hoping we'll have time at the end to talk about uh, um, what will have to change for the long term after the crisis is over. But, but the, the, what, what do you think of the – so here's a hard question. What do you think of the government's overall response to the crisis? So whether, you know, the government should be blamed or praised for whatever it did prior to um, the, uh, the, the financial crisis, what do, you, what do you think of its performance during the crisis? Uh, that is a hard question. Um, so, if if you, I think it depends how you how you define it. If you look at the government's response in terms of saving the financial system, uh, I think they did a good job. I think if you look at LIBOR spreads, which is uh, the interest rate banks charge to one another and is a good measure of risk, um, they skyrocketed in September, October, and, and November. And yeah, suggesting that banks were so nervous that they didn't even trust each other. Right? Absolutely, and and and, and so uh, the government's response did save uh, the financial system. And I think where my criticism comes in, and I want to caveat this, which I'm not in Treasury, I'm not there. Uh, there's a fog of war. It's easy. It's easy to criticize from from my perspective, but I do think they've lacked a sort of holistic approach. Um, so, for example, in September they saved AIG, but they've really let it lingered out um, and let some of the big problems with AIG fester, um, uh, requiring uh, that the, the bailout of AIG be work, reworked twice. And, of course, the public fury, which came out um, a few weeks ago, which has remarkably subsided. Um, <laughs> and, and so they've lacked a real holistic response to what they're going to do with these agencies. And I think um, – They've also lacked uh, a legislative response. I think it's been clear, um, and I know you have a view on this since, but from my perspective, it's been clear since at least uh, the spring of 2008 that the government really lacked the legislative authority it needed. Um, and it's only uh, with the firestorm over AIG uh, in the past month that Geithner has really done something that Treasury knew they needed to do, which is to have a bankruptcy process for these financial institutions and well, he's, modified he's, conservatorship. You mean he's proposed one or a, 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 a bill, or do you mean he's – Well, he hasn't even else. proposed a bill. Uh, he basically, said we, he came out and said we need this process. Right, right. Right. Um, and that, that hasn't happened, right. No, and, and, and we've really been – I mean, if, if you count the crisis from August 2007, we're already a year and a half into the crisis. Mm. Um, so August 2007? Yeah, all right. But th there wasn't a, a sense of crisis among the general public and the political class until the fall of 2008. Uh, fair, fair enough. I, I, I think in 2008 you, you finally had the legislative will. Um, you might have had the legislative will before if there was a sh strong leadership in the White House, but due to the election that was probably a, a, a vain hope. Okay, so, so you raised two issues. And one is this sort of general question of what, what the government should have done. Did it do what it should have done, or was it close enough? Mm -hmm. And the other is, you know, what's, what's the role of Congress in this? And, uh, and maybe we should talk about both things. So in terms sure. of what the government um, should have done, I, I think, yeah, I mean, I, of course, as you say, it's, it's impossible really to know. But at least the conventional wisdom seems to be that the government – should have taken over the financial system and more or less did, although in a kind of a in a kind of non obvious way. In other words, it, it stood behind all kinds of lending institutions and said, you know, if you need money, here it is. Right. And uh, and there are lots of ways that the government funneled money to these uh, institutions. It, it lent them uh, the money very cheaply through the Fed. It you know it bought up their commercial paper. Again, the Fed did this. It, um, it, it invested in these companies using the TARP money. Uh, that is, it just uh, essentially bought preferred stock. It, it put a lot of money into these companies. I guess this is more like a, a different kind of lending. A lending. It's just a, a more secure type of lending. Um, it, maybe it gets some, some equity in, in these, com in these uh, uh, companies. And so the, so the, the, the government so, – so what happened, I guess, is there, there are two problems. A lot of these banks and financial institutions – were solvent, you know, they, they were perfectly okay, but they they became illiquid. Um, they temporarily didn't have enough cash to meet their obligations. 
that, that's not a, such a big deal, right? So the government can lend them the, ca- the cash that they need to meet their obligations, and uh, and that takes care of things. But but it turned out, and that's I guess what Paulson, the treasurer, the uh, secretary of treasury under Bush thought. Um, and then there are more sophisticated ways of doing this, right? You could you could buy their mortgage-backed securities, which nobody else was buying as right. a way of giving them cash. Um, but then it turns out that, in fact, probably most of these institutions, or many of them, are really insolvent, which is a lot scarier. And uh, um, ideally, what the government would, wa- would want to do is, is wind them down. But um, I, ga- I gather that people were afraid that if they did this, this would have a big contagion effect, right? That's what happened with Le- with Lehman. That yeah. if you if you just say, okay, well, time to go into bankruptcy. Then it suddenly turns out that all these other institutions who think that they have m- relatively s- safe uh, investments in the in the company in question, like Lehman, or or you know just loans to them, suddenly they d- they don't have any money and they've become insolvent as well. So, th- so the government tries to stop this. So it was a kind of a crazy disorganized process where the executive branch, basically on its own, with a little bit of well, with a little bit of money from Congress, I should say, partly on its own and, p- and partly with the TARP funds, which is not a little bit of money. It's an absolutely astoundingly enormous amount of money from Congress. Right. Uh, took, care, took care of these things. And um, people were highly critical of the original Paulson plan, uh, which was to, which was focusing on the uh, on basically the liquidity problem um, and was in, and, and was uh, had the intention of buying up these uh, these uh, mortgage backed securities or tox- toxic assets or I guess they're called legacy assets now. Right. But then Paulson quickly moved to uh, making the investments. Right. And then, but it turns out maybe that wasn't such a bad idea after all. And now the Obama administration is going back to <laughs> purchasing the the uh, toxic a- a- assets. Um, so I, you know, I, I think at at least a very high level of generality, the government probably did what it had to do. See, as you said, seems to have been successful at least for the time being. And there could be a tremendous amount of disagreement about uh, that, the details of what of what it did. But but we should all maybe cheer. Is, is that too much to say? Sure, a pat on the back. A pat on a pat on the on the multiple backs. Right. Um, so but, but I will um, say, yeah. I mean, one thing that you mm-hmm. missed when you say uh, essentially the government went all in in the fall, um, and and really one of the interesting things is that while the TARP bill is an astounding amount of money, seven hundred billion dollars, it, it's it's in relative to what the Fed did, right. uh, it's yeah. it's it's much smaller. Yeah. Uh, the Fed right. has put uh, several trillion dollars of its balance sheet on the line, which is really the federal government's, and they've used. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac as vehicles to also um, uh, t- attempt to heal the market by buying up mortgage-backed securities. And right, so, and now, and now the FDIC is getting into the act, right? Right, all of which is stretching the statutory authority of, of all of these agencies right. uh, really to the breaking point. Um, right. And, uh, right. and and so when you say, just to reinforce your point, that Congress really had very little to do with this, um, even the TARP bill was... was, uh, was um, it, it wasn't really necessary in the sense that the, the government could have kept doing what they could have done uh, mm-hmm. through the Fed, but uh, I, I think that the, at some point they just felt they needed some legitimacy. Uh, yeah, and I do want to get to that point in just one second, but um, uh, but yeah, we, it's probably okay. So it's a little premature to, to do any uh, back padding because I guess there are two points. I mean, one is there, there's always been this libertarian view that we should have let every everything fail and. I'm glad we didn't do that, but I, I think it's important to acknowledge the, the logic of the argument, which is that what we've done is we've, we've in the short term, we've, we've made ourselves better off, but in the long term, um, these investors are going to think, and you know, various uh, actors in the market are going to think, look, you know, if we make bad investments, again, the government's going to step in with mm-hmm. trillions of dollars of taxpayers' money, some, some current money, some money from the future that's being borrowed, and, and save and save us, and so uh, things may be more difficult in the future. Maybe not. We we just won't know until the the future uh, finally comes around. And th- and then and then the the related point is just that even in the design of the particular institutions uh, right now that are being used to to essentially bail people out, 
one, this, this issue comes up again and again. And so the current plan, Geithner plan, to use the FDIC, as I mentioned before, well, to use a, a bunch of institutions to buy these uh, toxic, sorry, legacy uh, assets. <laughs> um, well, uh, a lot of people now are complaining that the government, you know, the government really wants uh, private investors to do this, but of course private investors don't want to buy these assets for, for all the old reasons, that they don't really know how much they're worth, or they do know how much they're worth, and they're worth a lot less than what the banks hope that they're worth, or, you know, and there are all kinds of reasons why this market hasn't worked. And so, well, to get private investors to purchase these assets, the government is essentially giving them a big subsidy. It, part, partly, the government is, I mean, this is quite complicated, partly the government is simply lending money to them, um, and, you know, in theory, they can recover uh, the government can recover its loan, but in practice, if the value of assets continue to decline, the government's going to bear the loss because of the way uh, this program is designed, not 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 the investors. And so, you know, it may be that you you do have to buy toxic assets, but there's some better way of doing it, one that puts uh, the government at less risk. Uh, but it, but it's very hard to say uh, at this point. No, I think I agree with that. I mean, we're essentially asking government in terms of uh, a program to design the perfect program. Um, and, and really, the, the, the goal here is to um, get the economy functioning again and not have a lost decade um, like what happened in Japan. Uh, unfortunately, um, because of that, uh, you have um, unexpected winners. Uh, so, for example, the banks that are bailed out um, and receive uh, low-cost government capital through these TARP injections, mm -hmm. um, and also in this program. And I think that comes back to maybe the first point, everything come, circles around, but mm -hmm. the first point about people who did nothing wrong, um, and there's a backlash element here, which is many mm -hmm. people look at this program and say, I did nothing wrong, I'm losing my job, or my, and now my neighbor who bought a nice house now is getting out of their mortgage and knew they couldn't afford it at the time. And more specifically, they're looking at this program, which is by, you know, admittedly uh, beneficial, um, and I'm talking about the public-private program that Geithner mm -hmm. announced, is beneficial to the people who buy these assets, and they're saying, why are we giving benefits to the same financial actors who got us in this place? Yeah, it's, and it's, it's a striking point, and the, and the, the political side of this. So, so from an economic perspective, yeah, the the problem is is that you have to pay off the bad guys. Or again, right. this goes back to the beginning: who are whether they're really bad. But certainly, they're people who are more and less responsible. And so they're, they're the grasshoppers and the ants. And the ants, you know, who may be losing their jobs, or maybe they're keeping their jobs, but they're not benefiting at all from the crisis, and they're going to be hurt in the form of higher tax payments in in the future. So they're looking around and they're saying a bunch of people who they regard as irresponsible doing quite well as a result of recent government interventions that, again, I think are quite rational from an economic perspective. They see investors um, and the managers of financial institutions, you know, keeping their jobs and getting bonuses, which, you know, are economically necessary to, to maintain the talent uh, that's needed uh, to address the crisis. But again, these are the people who are irresponsible or look irresponsible or at least more culpable than the ordinary uh, ants. And yeah. then, as you just mentioned, and, and, and we, we should say something about this as well, there are these various uh, new laws and programs for helping people who are not able to pay their mortgages. And again, you know, a lot of the people who can't pay their mortgages are, are people who um, are not really blameworthy, but they're often you know, people who took more risk, or saved less, bought a house that was somewhat larger than they should right. really have. They're people who are somewhat less responsible than uh, putting aside, you know, people with, with real disasters, than the people who, who were very cautious. And so, the, again, the ants, you know, with or without a job, you know, with their little house, you know, they have their little house <laughs> and their cheap car and, um, and all the rest Hopefully are looking around, and they're knowledge. also saying their neighbors, as you say, other ordinary people, not, not, not high-flying financiers, who, uh, who bought a McMansion and now are getting some kind of subsidy. But... Yeah. but the, from the, an economic perspective, and we haven't talked about this, from an economic perspective, helping uh, um, these uh, homeowners is, is actually quite sensible, even though people who think, who think of econ economics in a caricatured way usually think that uh, you, you don't want to help irresponsible or right. people who, who do badly. But the, the problem here is that um, 
is that a lot of people who own their homes, the value has declined, and and so they uh, they have a uh, it's rational for them whether or not they can pay their mortgages to walk away from from the house. So so you might have a house that you bought for four hundred thousand dollars with a four hundred thousand dollar mortgage. It's now worth two hundred thousand dollars. If you walk away from your house and uh, you you basically traded a negative two hundred thousand dollar asset, if you can call it that, a, a mm-hmm. two hundred thousand dollar loss for for zero. So it's a very rational investment, especially in states where, where banks don't have a legal right to go after you for the difference. Right. And, as, and, and as a practical matter, banks don't do it anyway. And then the, the value of the house will continue to decline when the bank foreclose on, forecloses on it. The, 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 the number that's usually bandied about in the mortgage, in the banking industry is 30 to 50 percent. The house is empty for a long period of time. It, it, uh, you know, maybe it's vandalized a little bit. It's not maintained very well. Um, and neighboring houses will lose their value as well, and so right. th- this is a this is a real loss. Uh, in in theory, the loss could be avoided through renegotiation. Uh, the homeowner and the bank could get together and renegotiate their mortgage, so that it's so that the uh, homeowner is no longer in the negative equity territory. In practice, this doesn't happen for a host of reasons. Partly the securitization of mortgages, which makes it hard for people to renegotiate. Partly because a lot of banks, especially big banks, are afraid that if they renegotiate, they'll just encourage uh, other homeowners, other of their borrowers, to, to you know to walk away or or be, or be irresponsible. And so the the government intervention, which essentially you know does a bunch of things, it, it pays loan servicers to renegotiate it. And there are other possibilities. Yeah, is is basically sensible, but it looks horrible, right? It just looks horrible to the p- people who were responsible. No, I, and think, I think I think yeah. uh, as as someone as someone said to me, and it, no one makes uh, uh, no one nothing makes a person matter than seeing their neighbor do better than them, um, and particularly off the government. Uh, mm-hmm. And and you're right that collectively um, this is a good program, uh, but. Um, individually, for those people who've done the right thing, it's 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 hard medicine to bear, even if they know that it is the right thing. And I think just just getting back to our, our about our talk about the government's response, I think um, people were generally um, tolerant of what was going on with the banks until the AIG uh, um, pay came out. Um, mm-hmm. Which I think is a government failure because uh, they bailed out AIG in September and, and knew about these payments. So either they were willfully blind or wanted the payments to be made. And, and there's a good argument for making those payments because right. we want these people to. We now have a 79% interest in AIG. Um, and so you, so, you want to pay your employees well. That's that's right. the reason. You know, you want you want to keep the good employees. Right. And you but, and you don't want them to leave. But I but, think, yes, I think that, that particular um, uh, tempest also shows a, a problem with part of the government's action, which is that the night, the, the Sunday night before the Monday uh, kerfuffle about the bonuses happened, AIG also announced um, who their counterparties were uh, for their trades and mm-hmm. also um, uh, w- w- what collateral payments had been put up. And I think there we saw about 60 to $80 billion worth of payments. I mean, AIG did a marvelous job of distracting public focus, um, and Congress really bought that uh, distraction. But the real issue with AIG and with these banks is not only did we, sa- we save this financial system, but what are we doing with these banks now? Um, and, and so, for example, with AIG, uh, we, we, the government actually bought out these credit default swaps at a premium uh, and, and, and paying uh, you know, Goldman Sachs uh, received about $6 billion alone, alone. Um, and uh, that these were not the market prices. And again, this may have been the right thing to do because it's in our interest to keep AIG up and running and people to do business with AIG and we want to subsidize the banks. But Congress has really lost their their monitoring focus. I don't know if Congress ever had it, but there's Mm -hmm. no focus on where the real funds are going. And no one's really asked Geithner and Bernanke, who were the Bush administration and are are here now. It's really been a a remarkably seamless team. Mm -hmm. Um, Where is the money going and why are we doing this? And I think one of the one of the things that you've highlighted and I've highlighted is this has been a remarkable act of administrative authority right. and a remarkable um, 
lack of action on the on the fact of Congress. Okay, and and so why though? So 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 this is you know th- so this is the key point. So it, it can be simplified as the following way. You know there there are clear things that should be done. Well, cl- relatively clear policies that the government should pursue from an economic perspective. But what's good economically is not necessarily popular politically, right? And, and this is the big problem. This is always a problem in, uh, you know, during crises and especially economic crises. Right. And, and you can see this so well now that the public is focused on things that it can understand, bonuses, right, Right, absolutely. Um, shower cur- well, not shower curtains. Sorry, that whatever thing bought. The, you know, the the, the, the redecoration of thirty six thousand dollar toilet. Yeah, whatever. You know, right. you know, exactly. So, just the things which are trivial. You know, couldn't be more trivial in the grand scheme of things. We're talking about trillions of dollars. The entire financial system. People losing their jobs. Who cares whether you know the head of some firm invests thirty six thousand dollars or thirty six million dollars or whatever it was in in in, in redecoration. So. So I'm, and I'm sure that I'm sure that the people in the executive branch don't care. I mean, I think people, and there are a lot of problems here. So the the, the government is running all these enormously complicated businesses. They're you know even too complicated, which are so complicated that it's not even clear that their own managers can run them. You have the government with a handful of people, underpaid people, trying to run all of these institutions. Right. It probably did come to their attention that there were bonuses. Bonuses might be an issue that people were sensitive about executive compensation. But they probably thought, look, we, we simply can't deal with this. It, it's just, you know, we could get it wrong. Um, you know, trying to figure out how much to pay people the right amount, that's a complicated, uh, difficult process that requires you to know a lot about who the people are and, you know, which, which you know, unit managers you can trust and which you can't. And you know, the government can't figure out what the, the right uh, bonuses are for, the, for these people or the right uh, compensation for these executives are. So, so the executive branch, I believe, quite rationally said, oh, let's, let's just hope this, you know, let's try to stay alive for another day and hope that, that there isn't a firestorm. And they're wrong. There, there was a firestorm. So, so Congress is on the scene. And Congress, you know, does everything wrong, it seems to me. It, 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 it sort of it tries to, it tries to uh, make a big deal about these relatively small issues because it knows that's what the, the public cares about. So, so one might say, well, it, it would be much better off if Congress just wasn't involved at all. But on the other on the other hand, given that ultimately it's politics, not economics, which is going to determine what happens, it does seem that Congress, when it's behaving responsibly, does play an important role. If it goes along with the executive, at least the executive can say when people get mad at them, you know, the people you elected agreed with us. So, you know, who are you yeah. going who are you going to elect? Um, who are you going to elect uh, to replace us? But but I don't think Congress can do more than that. You you, you seem to think they could. I, I can't imagine Congress, you know, this ridiculous, unwieldy, enormous institution, you know, finding this information and, and knowing what to do if they had it. I mean, what, what would you perceive the the sort of ideal Congress doing during the crisis? Well, I, I think there's two things. I, I, I tend to agree with you, uh, certainly back in September, and, and we saw this very illustratively, you know, with the TARP bill and mm-hmm. its failure to pass the first time, and then only because over a hundred and something billion dollars in pork was added uh, yeah. did it pass again. Um, yeah. And I think in times of of, of actual emergency, um, Congress really, uh, and I know you've written about this, really ha- ha- has very little capacity to act. Um, but I do think now we're we're six to eight months in at least from the initial crisis. And I think that Congress has two roles that can, it, it can have. Um, first is an actual monitoring capacity. And I'm not talking about these Barney Frank committee hearings with 40 congressmen. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about actually finding out where this money is going and why and acting as a check. Um, and I, I, I don't see that. But I think even more importantly, um, going forward, we have seen some real holes in the regulatory system that we've highlighted. Um, one was, uh, you know, too many regulators, um, perhaps some holes in regulation of credit default swaps, perhaps some holes in regulation of financial institutions. Um, and it's going to be the bill that comes out of Congress that changes this financial system. Um, and, you know, it, I'm, I'm hoping, I think it might. it's probably going to be a vain hope that Congress can um, pass an economic bill that, that does not overregulate, because one of the things that um, we say is we always regulate to the past crisis, not the future right. crisis. 
uh, the regulatory bubbles that follow the economic bubbles, right? Right, and we're in one. Um, and the question is, uh, can Congress act coherently and mm -hmm. uh, intelligently um, in, in enacting a regulatory reform bill? Mm -hmm. And here, I think the administration has been slow to act for, what, for whatever reason, whether they're waiting to pass the budget first Mm -hmm. Or they're waiting for Al Franken to inevitably arrive. <laughs> um, they, waiting they, for Al Franken, right? Right. <laughs> and uh, they, they, they've been very slow to propose the comprehensive reform and seize this initiative that you talk about, um, that Congress wants to focus on doing something and showing something to the people. Um, and th they can do that through a bill. Now, the, the bills that I've seen sort of talked about, and I testified before the Senate on this, um, seem to be um, okay. Uh, some of the bills floating around from the House are, are, are populist overreactions. Um, and I think one of the things, just finally to add on that, is um, one of the interesting things is one of the big beneficiaries of Geithner's plan is probably hedge funds. And of the villains of this, this tale, um, or maybe people who might be at fault if we, we adopt a lesser term, hedge funds were really remarkably uninvolved. Mm -hmm, um, right. This doesn't mean that they shouldn't be further regulated for the next crisis, but right. um, they, they'll be benefiting, but they were actually um, people who were pricing risk in the market that people should have seen. Uh, mm -hmm. Paulson made several billion dollars betting against the mortgage market, right. and uh, if people had followed his sign uh, more intelligently, and I'm not sure why they didn't, um, well, I do know why. Uh, we were in a bubble economy. <laughs> um, <laughs> they, would have, they would have known better. So, so let's let's uh, let's talk a little more about uh, about these things. So, so you, you imagine Congress engaging in oversight because you're afraid that currently, we, the way you put it, we don't know where the money is going. So, so let's let's just I just like you to say a bit more about that. What are you afraid of the, when you say we don't know where the money is going? What what concretely that you know that it's going, for example, to Democratic Party uh, supporters, you know, it's being used in a political way or that just errors are being made. And then once you tell us that, what exactly do you see Congress doing when it engages in oversight? And my worry here is that Congress doesn't have any better incentives than the executive branch does. So it, it may not like, like it when uh, the money is used in political rather than economically intelligent ways, but that might just mean that the members of Congress and the Oversight Committee will demand that their political preferences be satisfied rather than those of the people in the executive branch. Right. I, I think the overriding theme here is a general distrust by the executive branch of the political nature of Congress. Um, and what, what do I mean by that? Mm -hmm. I think that the government has been is, is very concerned uh, in the Bush administration, in the Obama administration, that Congress will begin directly meddling with banks mm -hmm. and operating them. And so during all the bailouts of the fall and into the spring, and AIG is again a, the, the prototypical example, the government took great pains to to keep from saying it was taking control of these entities. The government only took 79% of AIG to keep its, keep it off its balance sheet. Mm -hmm. um, who owns AIG right now? The shares that, that the government got were actually placed into a trust uh, that the government ac exercises very little, if, if mm -hmm. no control over. Um, again, this was done by the Bush administration, but uh, it was designed to keep Congress from meddling. Right. And, and Which so, I think is sensible, but you don't, uh, I under, right? Isn't that your point? Well, I think I'm queasy about it. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think it, it, I approach this from a corporate law perspective, mm -hmm. which is aligning ownership with control. Mm -hmm. And I think um, in the fears of uh, political intervention, uh, the government has placed control too far away. And, and so uh, you get these bonus situations. You get these payments that are out. You get... Um, the fact that we, even though we're, we're really banking Bank of America and Citigroup, we still have no real control over them. Um, but, but what control do you want? This, this, is what, this is what puzzles example. me, is, is right. that, I mean, we already, we already talked about compensation. I thought you agreed that, you know, you do have to pay these guys a lot. And it seems pretty clear that if Congress was actually running uh, these institutions, that, you know, then these executives would be paid as much as, you know, congressmen or, or less even. And they'd all quit. They might be paid by law professors. <laughs> or law pro well, God forbid. Yeah. Well, so uh, so whatever, you know, they're, they're paid, you know, less than millions of dollars. And that might actually destroy these firms and cause more harm than good. 
that, that's what I would be afraid of if, if Congress were running these things, or that Congress think, would. Sorry, yeah, you, you don't though. No, no, you know? I, 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 I have no. I, I, I view Congress here as a monitoring function and a check, but unfortunately, the outcome has been that the government cannot. There needs to be real compensation reform in these entities. There needs to be a, a, a movement away from the heads I win, tails you lose compensation system. And I, I'm skeptical that the banks will impose this unless uh, the government really pushes them. And, and I, I'm not saying that someone shouldn't make millions of dollars or, or even more if they're, if they're producing billions or hundreds of millions for their bank. Um, that's certainly justified. I have no no problem with that whatsoever. The, the problem is they should have compensation systems in effect that don't uh, reward short-term gain and allow well, they, externalities they, 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 to occur uh, um, and moral hazard to take place um, now that they know that they have the government backstop. Yeah, but right, they, right. Uh, well, that's important that with the government backstop. But... Uh, well, do you think that, for example, the government should say to AIG, all right, here, here's the way you're going to compensate people now, period? Uh, no, I think, well, I think two things should be done. One, I think that the government should uh, put in, uh, should say to the banks, come to us with a bonus plan that sets forth these goals and a compensation system that sets forth yeah. these goals. I'm just and so skeptical that the government can figure this out. I mean, compensation... Yeah. Compensation is a really delicate and complicated uh, issue. Yeah. You know, the government can tax people who are wealthy. That's fine. You know, it's it's not terribly intrusive. Um, it can, um, you know, it can figure out how to compensate its own employees. My sense is it doesn't do a very good job at that. I mean, the in the government, talk about you know moral hazard. It's very hard to get fired uh, from the government. Yes. Yeah. The the. Um, you know, these compensation plans, yes, from a theoretical perspective, I, and I understand, you know, exactly uh, your perspective, they're, they're hard to understand. And yet they per, they persevere, and shareholders by now have figured them out, and sophisticated institutional investors have figured them out. Maybe they're not that happy, but and maybe they're just putting moderate pressure on firms to revise their practices, and maybe there are reasons why they can't be more aggressive that are hard to grasp. Um, you know, there, there could be all kinds of complicated things going on here. Uh, the, the idea that we would sort of enact a law that tries to regulate compensation practices in corporations seems seems uh, questionable to me. But even more questionable. That, but if we were going to do that, that would be the way to go, right? But no, the idea I think that, the law would, right, would inevitably. No, we would never do that. Never but the, the idea that that you know Congress, in the course of over, uh, overseeing these. These businesses, you know, I mean, do banks do that? Maybe you know the answer to this question. When a bank, suppose a bank lends an enormous amount of money to just a private firm, and, and it knows, you know, it could lose, it lose its money if the firm does poorly. Do, do banks try to impose restrictions on how on the compensation of managers? Uh, no, no, they they get they get at it through income tests and revenue. Right. So tests they don't they don't banks don't tests. do that. And you know these guys have been doing right. this for hundreds of years. And they could, you know, they owe, they put in all kinds of loan covenants. So if banks don't do that, you know, yeah. why the government or share, and shareholders don't do it? You know, why should the government? It's hard to know what sometimes whether the government is a shareholder or a, just a big lender. But right, right. So. All right, it's but, acting like a lender when it, when I'm arguing it should be acting like a shareholder. More like a shareholder. And it seems like even, you're saying it should be acting more like a lender. Right. Well, but even the shareholders in, in the private market don't seem to put much pressure. On, that's the whole problem. Doesn't the, the shareholders don't seem to care as much about uh -huh. um, these compensation practices as um, as uh, you know academic theorists sensibly you know th think they should and but I, I think you know sometimes when the academics look at reality and, and it doesn't it's not acting according to their theories you know there, there might it's just as likely that there's something wrong with the theory yeah. as, as with uh, the way people are be are behaving um, we're running out of time I, I think right. we could probably talk for another you know more than more than 50 seconds that we have left but we should um, say a little bit about the future uh, Steve um, so once this crisis is over, the, the big uh, challenge would be to prevent it from recurring, and it's going to require mm -hmm. uh, uh, some laws. Uh, what should those laws look like? 
Uh, what should they look like, or what will they look like? Well, um, both. You can do both. What I, should I, I think. I mean, I think, first of all, if you take a step back, maybe the government's practice is just to run down these big banks um, and take apart the big institutions and allow the middle market investment bank and hedge funds and populate them, um, although that might be too clever. Uh, but I, I think in terms of a bill... Um, I think we'll probably, in terms of what we'll probably get, is I, I think there's a real focus on black holes in the mm-hmm. regulatory system, um, such as the credit default uh, swap market, which is largely unregulated, and the hedge fund, uh, hedge funds, and other um, 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 alternative uh, financial institutions. I think um, those will be come into the regulatory system. Uh, a systemic regulator will probably be created or should be created um, that will have oversight over um, these new uh, the hedge funds and other financial institutions. Yeah, so, so let me interrupt. I mean, what does sure. that mean concretely? And, and people have blamed the credit default swap market. That, that's actually – I've read some academic papers that put a, a, an enormous amount of uh, blame on, on, that, on that market. W- what can the government do in particular – to uh, regulate that market. Well, I, I haven't read that paper, so I'm not. I'm not as. Bla- I'm not blaming the credit default swap. But mm-hmm. I think the criticism of the credit default swap market is that it's opaque, mm-hmm. and there's no central clearing agency. So pricing is not as efficient, um, and so people can't see that. Oh, this credit default swap is trading at a very low price. Perhaps I should invest in the underlying bond. Mm-hmm. And so one of the goals of regulation would be to bring this market into the open uh, where it is publicly traded. Um, and so uh, yeah. that's, that's the, been one proposal. Yeah, I mean, the problem is, I mean, that's very sensible, but the, the problem is that if we think that the ultimately the source of the crisis was rational investors taking on too, risk, too much risk because they believed you know, ultimately the government was going to rescue them, um, or, you know, some investors taking on too much risk because other investors were foolishly willing to take on a lot of risk. Or some investors taking on too, too much risk because whatever the government did, the, the cost of failure would be borne by other people in general. You know, that, that is what you mean by systemic risk, right? Right. So simply making the, the market, this market more transparent is not going to address any of those problems. Um, in well, fact, might... It, might make the, it might make them worse because people will find it easier – to, you know, in essence, buy insurance against, you know, the default of a, of a bond that they're holding or, or what have you. And and presumably the person on the other side of the transaction might be thinking, yeah, you know, I'll do this because if everything falls apart, the government will rescue me. Well, I think that's a secondary issue. I mean, mm-hmm. so we have we have a very big issue now, which you, which you just referred to, of moral hazard and how people will act um, given the government's backstop, um, which is clearly apparent. Uh, and I think one of the tricks, um, and we probably don't have uh, the, the 30 minutes uh, we, we need to really talk about it, is how do you set up a system that gives people an actual stake in it? And for those that are too big to fail or too interconnected to fail, appropriately regulates them. Mm-hmm. Because the government's not going to bail out me. Right. Uh, but the government might bail out mega bank, and how do we? How do we? Do we want mega banks? We need to make that decision. Right. And if we do, um, how do we regulate them? And so that's right. another issue, uh, aside from credit default swaps and hedge funds, that the government will be dealing with. Right. And and what does that mean, though? Also, I mean, what would so you mentioned and people talk about it, somebody who regulates systemic risk. So right right now that occurs in the banking area. In fact, the Fed and the FDIC, and I, I know for sure, and I'm sure other banking agencies as well, have specific you know, statutory authorizations that say, that say, well, if there's systemic risk you know, at issue, do whatever you, you, know, do whatever you, you want, basically. Right. Um, and, uh, and so they can, but of course they can't deal with uh, institutions outside of the, well, the Fed sort of can, but anyway, they're not really set up to deal with institutions outside of the, of the uh, uh, banking industry. So, so what would need to be changed? So would we need um, something like uh, an FDIC for the investment banking industry and the hedge fund industry? What are we, what are we looking at? Uh, well, I, there's a debate going on, which is who is the systemic risk regulator? 
and and uh, in essence, who will set capital requirements for these alternative financial institutions, and who will monitor them on a day to day basis. Um, and as part of that, though, there's talk of a lender of last re- resort. Mm-hmm. Uh, the lender of last resort will inevitably be, inevitably be the Fed. It is now. Um, it's probably best suited. But I think there's an issue, uh, again, of do, how much power do we want to give the Fed in terms of uh, systemic monitoring. Um, the Fed wants this power. They've said it. Um, I think there's a populist sentiment in Congress not to locate it in uh, the Fed because it is a more uh, remotely based agency mm-hmm. than other agencies. Um, and there's a real policy question about whether uh, we want to treat this as an independent agency uh, under normal oversight and, and, and congressional and uh, court review, or do we want it uh, in the, the more remote uh, Federal Reserve? Uh, and there are arguments for and against both, which, uh, you know, I tend to favor putting in an independent agency because I have a slight, uh, because of my congressional monitoring streak. Um, mm-hmm. I'm sure, I don't know how you feel about that. Well, but you wanted to, you wanted to create one gigantic agency rather than all these, to replace the current system of fragmented agencies. Now it sounds like you want to create yet another uh, new agency. Uh, I think, you know, I, I don't think that, there's basically three models that have been put forth. Um, it's either one big agency or two big agencies, uh, or you can have three. And, and the goal is really yeah. you need a consumer protection agency, um, which is really what the SEC does. Uh-huh. Um, you need a monitoring agency, a capital agency, which is really the FDIC, um, and is really no more than um, just merging the bank agencies we have right. now. Right. Um, so uh, the consumer emerges, the SEC, the CFTC. And then uh, the third is um, uh, the systemic risk and lender of last resort. And obviously this creates all sorts of bureaucratic problems and other issues which, which uh, we need to think through. But one of the ultimate goals of this is, and really if we kept the current regulatory system and did what I'm about to say, uh, we would probably get a large way there, which is filling these black holes in the regulatory system. And, 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 and still, though, exactly what does that mean? So take layman or a hedge fund, if you want. Right. Would, it, would they be regulated like a bank in the sense that, you know, there'd be specific requirements about what they can have in their books and, you know, what their, their, uh, <coughs> their um, you know, how much equity they have and, you know, given certain levels of risk in their assets and further that if something goes wrong, that at, at that point an agency can swoop in and shut the doors and, you know, de- take it over? Is, is, that a, is that plausible? In other words, should the banking model just be extended over the entire financial system, if that, uh, for, if that for, is possible? Well, I think um, I think we should uh, set up a disclosure system so we at least know who's out there, um, and we can keep this uh, a lot of this disclosure is proprietary to hedge funds, mm-hmm. so some of it would have to be confidential to the regulator themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, for those that are deemed to perhaps have systemic effects on the system, uh, should be subject to perhaps this conservatorship that mm-hmm. that uh, Geithner is proposing, and also uh, capital requirements if if necessary. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean that that that's essentially my sense as well. It's quite dramatic though, and there's always this concern that the financial system will simply evolve in, in order to address it. What what it what? Right. The, yeah, I mean, we've already seen this to some extent with car companies essentially. Also, at the same time, being, uh, you know, banks or whatever you want to call them, cre- credit institutions, right. and and you could imagine big problems in figuring out how to regulate institutions that don't really look like banks or financial institutions, but somehow or other serve the same, the ser- serve the same function. Now also, I, I guess I'd be concerned that, you know, that everything would just migrate into into other countries with lending back to the United States. And, and be a little worried about that as well. I, I, I agree with both those yeah. statements. I think they're they're big issues. Um, and uh, you, well, you teach at Chicago; it's the home of the, the financial revolution. Um, I think you know you need to build in flexibility in the in any statute to pick that up. Um, in terms of competition and abroad, uh, any any regulatory solution that we have that is not that where there's no buy-in to the other financial capitals of the world will, will ultimately fail. Okay. 
Well, that seems like a good note, a note of gloom and uncertainty for us to stop at. So, so this is fun, and, uh, and uh, thanks very much. No, thank you, Eric. Okay. Take care.